Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As we begin, let me ask you a question. What does greatness look like? What would look truly great? Uh, we got Britain's best answer to that question a week ago, didn't we, with the coronation of King Charles III? Uh, royal carriages and fanfares and crowds and crowns. Here is the uh, Sunday Times from last week. At last, their crowning glory. Uh, is that what true greatness looks like? Uh, some of you think not. I asked my flatmate uh, whether that's something uh, that would be particularly enjoyable. Uh, you can guess at what answer I got. Uh, King Charles himself described the whole weekend as a glorious occasion. Is that what greatness looks like? Maybe instead it's a Eurovision win. Uh, for those who are more into that sort of thing, Laureen singing tattoo to a crowd of thousands, uh, millions around the world watching big fireworks and fanfare and lights and a cheering crowd and singing between two blocks. It was a weird show. You can Google it if you didn't see it. Uh, but is that what greatness looks like? Is that what is truly great? We get God's answer to what is truly great uh, by looking at Philippians 2, 1 to 11, that reading uh, that Amber read so well for us just now. Uh, the theological heart of this book of Philippians, which we've been studying over the last month or so, uh, this passage is one that we started to look at last week, but we've returned to it this evening in order to see more of the treasures that it has to offer us, in order to see particularly how it shows us true greatness. But it does so by turning our attention to the death of the Lord Jesus. Now, there's no carriages or crowns here, rather the humiliating death of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago is what God presents as the most glorious act. And as we'll see, Paul writes this to the church there. It is here for us in the Bible to show us that if you want to live a truly great life, if you want to live a truly excellent life, then it is to Jesus' death that you need to look. In fact, I think we'll go as far as to see that if you want to see what it means to be truly human, then it is to Jesus' death that you are to look. Last week we said that this path of service was right, but this week we are to see that it is great. True greatness, as it turns out, is cross-shaped. And Paul starts by showing that the death of Jesus was the greatest sacrifice. Uh, the greatest sacrifice, point one uh, on your handout. Let me read again from verse five. Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. 
The extent of any sacrifice is communicated, isn't it, by what someone had to start with and what they gave up. When I give up smoking for Lent every year, it's not actually that much of a sacrifice. I don't smoke the rest of the year, so it's really not that big a deal. And so Paul draws our attention to the starting point, if I can put it that way, and affirms what Jesus himself made clear in his teaching, that his starting position was the glory of heaven. Indeed, that he existed for eternity past, verse 6, in the form of God. Uh, the Bible's teaching is that we have one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They exist in a perfect unity, what we refer to now as the Trinity, and they have existed for all eternity past. Jesus existed before stepping into the world, enjoying the endless joys of heaven and the praise of heaven's angels. There was nothing about him that needed to come to earth. He was in the form of God. It wasn't as though he was bored or dissatisfied or lacking in any way. And yet, verse 6, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That is, it wasn't something for him to, to use for his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing. Or as some translations have it, he emptied himself. And not that he ceased to be God or that he ceased to be at all. Rather, as one commentary has put it, it is a graphic expression of the completeness of his self-renunciation. It includes all the details of humiliation that follow and is defined by these. In other words, rather than speculating on what that means, Paul goes on to explain what, Jesus, what, what it means for Jesus to make himself nothing. Look at verse 7 with me. He made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus, the one through whom all things exist, the Lord of all creation, humbled himself by stepping into the confines of his creation. Maybe you've seen the TV show Undercover Boss, where a CEO of a company puts on the uniform of a junior employee and goes and lives out a bit of time on the factory floor. It was recently reported, presumably to nobody's surprise, that quite a lot of it is actually just staged, but it makes some pretty good TV. And yet, of course, that's not a big enough illustration, because that's just stepping from the CEO to the factory floor. That's not that far. I imagine instead that you were, let's imagine you were to make an ant farm, and you made all that, I don't know what it's made of, I should have researched this before coming up with the illustration, and maybe perspex screens, and you fill it with soil and make tracks for the ants to go through, and you put some ants in, and then imagine that you found a way of shrinking yourself down so that you could actually go right down to the size of an ant. I realize this is almost the plot of Ant-Man, the Marvel comic or film, but try and put that out of your mind. And imagine that you did that so convincingly that there was no sign that you were any different from any of the other ants. And then we might get a hint, a just a hint of verse 7. He made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And yet, of course, Paul doesn't stop at verse 7. Verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, this undercover God if I can put it that way, humbled himself to the point of being killed by those he had created and killed in the most humiliating way possible by death on a cross. A crucifixion where the victim is nailed to a cross and left to die in a process that can only be likened to torture. It was a pattern of death so humiliating it was considered too much to put a Roman citizen through. It was a servant's death. But Jesus, verse 7, took the form of a servant in order that he could die, even die on a cross. And all of this so that he could bear the punishment that we deserve. Many have rightly observed that the, in the background of this passage is a 700-year-old poem, Isaiah 53. A 700-year-old poem at the time, it's now two and a half year, a thousand years old in which God promised a servant who would be substituted for the sins of the people. A poem that acknowledges we are sinners, rebels against God, and yet spoke of a day, of a day when someone would come and take the punishment that we deserve, bearing God's anger on our behalf. 
It's like a kind of scandalous episode of Undercover Boss where the filming has to get cut short halfway through because it turns out the whole factory floor is guilty of a capital offence and the undercover boss has himself chosen to go onto the factory floor in order to somehow take the punishment for them. It, it baffles, doesn't it? You can't imagine it happening. And yet it did. That is why Jesus stepped into his creation in order to bear our punishment and to offer us free forgiveness. You often hear about examples of self-sacrifice, don't you? I googled it. There's plenty of examples there. A Fujio Kashita, the 57-year-old Japanese firefighter, uh, who, warning uh, his local town of a tsunami, uh, required him to run to the fire station and just set off the alarm. Only the bell wasn't working, and so he found a massive bell, ran to the roof, and shook it for so long that many were saved, but not him. Or Muelma Magalenas in the Philippines, uh, who was an 18-year-old rescuing many, over 30 people from a swollen river after a typhoon hit, only to succumb uh, himself in the end. And yet Jesus' sacrifice is so much greater. So much greater because he came from the infinite glory of heaven. The praises of heaven's angels gathered around his throne and he stepped into his creation in order to suffer the indignity of servanthood, of death, even death on a cross, even bearing God's wrath for us so that we wouldn't have to. I wonder, have you ever considered the extremes of what Jesus went through for you? Uh, if you're not a Christian, do you realize how much Jesus gave up for you? How great his sacrifice in order to rescue you? If you are a Christian, have you given thought recently to the scale of his sacrifice? And we often think, I guess, about how amazing it was for Jesus to die for us. But have you considered how far he came in order to take our place? How vast the distance, how extreme the drop. Just linger over verse 6 and 7, would you? Reflect on that this week. Jesus' death is the greatest sacrifice. And because of that, it shows us most clearly what God is like. Point two on the handouts. Jesus' death is the greatest revelation of God. Let me read from verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, having given himself over to death, Jesus didn't stay dead. Now, the consistent testimony of the eyewitnesses was that he was raised from the dead, uh, indeed raised into heaven. And Paul here spells out the theological significance of that. Uh, Jesus rising from the dead and ascending into heaven were not just a kind of rebound effect of dying, like pushing a float underwater and watching it pop up again. No, this was an exaltation, a glorification like the coronation of King Charles III last weekend, honored in the sight of all, given, verse 9, the name that is above every name. Uh, names are a big deal in the Bible, and none more so than God's personal name, Yahweh, a name so precious it was rarely spoken, uh, but instead just written down as Lord. And so when Paul says that Jesus was given the name that is above every name, he's saying that Jesus is given that name, that he's so exalted to such a high place that the name Jesus will be considered kind of synonymous with Lord. It's why you see the Lord Jesus all the way through the New Testament. And indeed, as he puts it in verse 11, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It'll be the universal recognition that Jesus is the Lord, Yahweh, the one true God. Rather puts last week's chorus of millions into perspective, doesn't it? Uh, whether you watch the coronation or not, I'm sure you'll have heard about the, the chorus of millions, that moment when everyone was invited to swear their allegiance to the king. I won't ask you to tell me whether or not you did. Some of us, I guess, did. Some of us didn't. But with Jesus, all will do this. Verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus, 
Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There'll be no one saying, not my God. This is not an optional chorus of millions, but a no choice chorus of billions. Every person who has ever lived. As someone tweeted earlier this month, no matter how you think you'll address God at the end of time, two things will happen. You will bow before him and you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And not a promise that all will be saved. Some of us will confess him as Lord with delight. Our Lord has come. Some of us in defeat, the all too late submission to a Lord they have not served. But all of us in agreement, verse 11, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that is the praise that's only due to one person. Indeed, the Bible is clear. God alone is to be exalted in this way. That's what we've been saying all evening. It was what we heard in Isaiah 45, a bit of which is printed on the handout there. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. It's a passage that's been described as one of the clearest declarations of the uniqueness of God. And that uniqueness of God passage is exactly what Paul wants us thinking about. In fact, he uses the same language. I wonder if you spotted the connection. Look at Philippians 2 verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, Yes, the God of the Bible is the unique, one true God. And Jesus is that God. Not to the exclusion of the Father's glory, not in competition with the Father. As we've said, uh, God exists as one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect unity. And indeed, as verse 11 says, They will confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But don't lose the strength of that claim. Whether it is in delight or in defeat, all in heaven and on earth will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all that would be shocking enough, but shocking, more shocking still, is the reason that Jesus gets this recognition here. The reason that he is exalted to that place. What did Jesus do to warrant that divine label? What did Jesus do to which God wanted to attach that name? Of course, there's a sense in which that's a stupid question. He, he's God. He never ceased to be God. But something prompted the Father at this point to bestow on him the divine name. Look at verse 8 again. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. For so long, I just sort of skipped over that word. I thought it was just kind of then. This is the next thing that happens. But Paul says, therefore, Jesus humbled himself. And therefore, for that reason, because of his death, God has highly exalted him. Jesus has been exalted to the highest place because he humbled himself to death on a cross. The name Jesus has been put on a par with Yahweh, the Lord, because of his radical self-giving. The death of Jesus, if you like, warranted the divine label. Because of his death, the Father has attached the divine name to Jesus. Jesus gave himself utterly in sacrifice. And God the Father points to it and says, that, that right there, that's it, that is what I am like. Self-giving, self-sacrifice, the death of Jesus on the cross is at the heart of what the one true God is like. As I've put on the handout, Jesus' death is the greatest revelation of God. In fact, that's what you can see in Isaiah 45. Go and have a read of it later, and you'll see how integral God's saving of the nations is to his revelation of his uniqueness. Uh, But this isn't the sort of thing that uh, I'm the first person to recognize. The late theologian Charlie Moore put it like this, Uh, He wrote, God in the incarnation bestowed upon the one who is on an equality with him an earthly name, which has come to be in fact the highest of names because service and self-giving are themselves the highest of divine attributes. Or more recently, uh, someone called Richard Baucom has uh, put it like this. 
The identity of God, who God is, is revealed as much in self-abasement and service as it is in exaltation and rule. The God who is high can also be low because God is God not in seeking his own advantage, but in self-giving. And do you see what they're saying? God reveals himself most supremely at the cross, which is why as Jesus humbled himself to the point of death, to that God responded by saying, that's what I'm like, and bestowed on his son the name that is above every name. Isn't that huge? It is to say that this self-giving love is not alien to God, but at the heart of who he is. As our last song will put it, it is love so amazing, so divine. Or as Balcom puts it a little bit later in this book, in this act of self-giving, God is most truly himself. And maybe you heard that promise that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that no choice chorus of billions. And you thought, how despotic, how selfish. A friend of mine has said to me before that she doesn't believe in God. And even if she did think that he exists, she wouldn't want him to. Because she doesn't know what he is like. And look at what he does with his divine sovereignty. Not a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, humbled to the point of death, even death on a cross. He gave himself for us, and God pointed to it and said, that, that's it, that's what I'm like. It's as though God identifies himself by the nail marks in his hands. When God was choosing a brand logo, he chose a cross. Self-giving is at the heart of what God is like. Did you know that that was what God was like? Do you know that God? When I was chatting this passage through with some of the staff here uh, over the last few weeks, I shared this idea with a little bit of trepidation. Is that that right? Is it heretical to say that's at the heart of what God is like? And they all responded to me like, isn't this the most obvious thing in the world, Tim? Uh, We've sort of, we have read John's gospel, haven't you? In fact, some of you might have seen similar ideas in Mark or will do at some point in the future. But for me, this this recognition is earth-shattering. Jesus' death is not just a revelation of his humanity, uh, that he had flesh and blood. It is somehow a revelation of his divinity, the unique self-giving character of the one true God. It is the culmination of the whole Bible story in revealing what our God is like. From its earliest pages, when God reveals himself as gracious and merciful, Through to that often quoted line, God is love. This is what they're talking about. This self-giving of God. The God who identifies himself by the nail marks on his hands. The God who chose the cross as his brand logo. Do you know that this is what God is like? Do you know this God? Paul wants us to see that this is what God is like. And he wants us to change. He wants this to change the way that we live. A final point on the handouts. Jesus' death is the greatest pattern for life. If uh, self-sacrifice, if self-giving are at the heart of who God is, then there is no better way to live. Throughout this series, we've been thinking about how to identify premium living, how to approve, how to identify what is excellent. And we've already said that involves love abounding more and more. Printed there on the handout, Paul's prayer for the Philippians that their love would abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. But now we see what Paul means by knowledge and all discernment. It is knowing this about God, understanding this about what God is like. It will transform the way you view the world. It will enable you to approve what is excellent. It will enable you to serve. Understand this about God, and you'll see that sacrifice is not grim. It's glorious. It's not demeaning, it's divine. To count others more significant than yourself is to follow the path of Jesus, God himself. means the illustration I've been using throughout this series is just not enough, is it? I've been talking about how to approve what is excellent by looking at chocolate, Hotel Chocolat particularly, and comparing it to dung. In fact, Tracy, who some of us will know, has been away in, uh, in New Zealand and came back and gave me some kiwi poo. Uh, which it turns out is actually chocolate, not kiwi poo, but it really makes the point of comparing Hotel Chocolat with this. But of course, they're all stupid. Sorry, that wasn't meant to wake you up, but it did. That's useful. 
They're stupid, aren't they? Because they're so trivial. What we're talking about here is the opportunity to be like God. This is the most glorious way to live. Can you see why Paul doesn't just bear suffering? He rejoices in it. Why next week he'll say that even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering, even if I'm to die in service of you, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Can you see how this book might hold together suffering and say that that is joyful? Jesus' death shows us that God is a self-giving God. And so to walk his path of sacrifice is the greatest way to live. I read this week this line, the early Christians are among some of history's earliest and most tragic examples of sacrificing everything for a singular belief. Is that what you think? Stephen, James, Peter, Paul himself, history's most tragic examples. If you were to give everything for the service of the gospel, if you were to sacrifice everything, would that be tragic? Sacrifice is not demeaning, it's divine. And that's why the best of philosophy calls for it. The best of human religions try and call us to some sort of self-sacrifice. It's why when we see it in people, we think it's good, a beautiful thing. Fujio Kushita, the firefighter, or Muel Mar Magdalena's, the Filipino rescuer. This sort of sacrifice, we see it and we think that's good. We think it's beautiful. After all, you were made to image God, to bear his image. You were built to display that greatness of God to the world. And you do that most clearly when you display this highest of divine attributes. True humanity is not about self-fulfillment, but self-sacrifice. And so the best of philosophy calls for this. Our fundamental humanity longs for it. And yet those things can't produce it. Of course they can't. Because every moral system will only produce those who resemble the one they follow. Every idol transforms its worshipper. Every religion produces copies of itself. But idols don't give, they take, they demand. There is no God that radically serves except for one God who wonderfully happens to be the real God who made you, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who says, come to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, the one who died in our place to rescue us and to reveal what he is like, the God who identifies himself by the nail marks on his hands, the God who chose a cross as his brand logo, the best of philosophy calls for this. Our fundal, fundamental humanity longs for it, but it is Christ and Christ alone who has delivered the rescue that finally enables it. Let me say that, that means this passage is not just saying go and be more sacrificial. It won't work if that's all you take away from this. Um, if you're not a Christian and you just go away and try and be more sacrificial, it's going to fail. It is only those who are rescued by the Lord Jesus who are enabled to follow this path. Of course, there are examples of self-sacrifice from people who aren't Christians, and not all Christians are perfectly self-sacrificial. I know I'm not. But you will become like the God you worship. And there is only one God with nail marks in his hands. Come and get to know Jesus. If you're here as someone who's not a Christian, come to the events we've talked about this week. Find out about him. He is the greatest revelation of the God who made you. He died to rescue you, and he has a much better way to live. But if you are a Christian, someone whom the Lord has saved, well, Paul tells us to follow in this path. Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Give yourselves to the cause of the gospel, even if that means radical self-giving. Not a three-quid economy gospel, but a full-blooded heart and soul commitment to the salvation of others. Give yourself to the eternal benefit of others, knowing that that is 
truly human. It is to bear the image of God in his highest of divine attributes. What does greatness really look like? What would it look like to be truly great? It turns out true greatness is cross-shaped, far greater than any coronation or competition. In his self-giving, the Lord Jesus has shown us what God is like. And surely there's nothing greater than that. Let me lead us in a prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful, wonderful uh, description in these verses of the Lord Jesus, of his sacrifice for us, and of what that tells us about you. Please, would you help us to understand more deeply the unique wonder of that sacrifice? And please, would you help us to see it as the truly glorious path that it is, that we might not only benefit from Jesus saving death, but also follow in his path until that great day when he returns and every tongue confesses that he is Lord to your praise and glory. Amen. Um, There's a few questions here about um, uh, what this looks like in practice. So let me ask you one of them. What sort of decisions would this mindset impact? Um, Do you have some real life everyday examples for us? Uh, I think this affects not just decisions where I have a choice uh, of what I'm going to do, but but even just how I'm going to respond to something. Uh, So Paul, a couple of weeks ago, was talking about the way that he considered his his imprisonment and his arrest, and he didn't really have a choice over it. We can see later on in the letter that that was just something that was going to happen to him, and yet he was sharing how he evaluated it. How, How does it impact... Decisions we make, it even affects the way that you respond uh, to, to what's going on. But of course, it does also affect the way that you think about other people and how you serve other people. I wonder, when you came into church today, if you're a Christian here, did you think, where are my friends? Or did you think, where are there people I can serve? If someone asks you to do something, do you think, is that what I want to do? Or do you think, would that serve other people better? It's very hard to start being specific about what this might impact because I just think it has an impact on every single thing. And I know that because as I've been preaching on this over the last few weeks, I've thought, goodness, this is hard. (laughs) And it has struck me very frequently that this is a challenge. But I wonder if tonight's passage is one of the things that I need to go away and pray through more because if I really believe that serving other people is this divine, glorious thing, and I do believe it, But if I believed it more than I do at the moment, I would be thrilled when you give me the opportunity to serve you. And you can test that later. You can come and ask me to do something and see whether or not I really believe this. And if I don't, shame on you, Tim. It's not very serve it. So don't say that. But do, as in genuinely, it would be a wonderful thing, not just to sort of challenge each other with what can we try and get other people to do, but encourage each other with this reality. Jesus sacrificed himself as this incredible revelation of what God is like. I've gone way off the question now, haven't I? What does it look like in practice? Um, Just so many different things. Last week, I suggested a few things it could look like in practice. Have a listen to the talk. Uh, Just kind of tiny kind of steps forward, uh, being more welcoming to others, inviting them around to your house. Um, There'd be lots lots of other things. But but I think the big thing that I mentioned last week, when we're looking at the first half of this passage, that there's a particular focus to this. Jesus' model of service was for the salvation of others. He died in order that we might be saved. Two weeks ago, Paul said that we're striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So this isn't just saying, whatever anyone else wants, that goes. Our great hope and desire and prayer for each other and for other people is that they might be saved. And so really, if you come and ask me something afterwards, the question I'm going to be asking, I hope, is will this help you to follow Jesus? That's the question I want to be asking. Thank you, Tim. There's a few questions here, but when it's really hard to do this. Um, so how do you continue being self-sacrificial when you genuinely feel like you're on your last tether of patience or energy? And if I ask this one at the same time, how do you sustain the energy or capacity to always count others above yourself? This doesn't always feel glorious, but often feels overwhelming. I know Jesus did this, and we should follow his example, but he was God. So how can I do what God did? 
Uh, it is hard. Let's, let's not pretend that this is a sort of a thing that if you grasp suddenly tonight, everything will change tomorrow. The first thing I'd say is to pray. Uh, ask for the Lord's help. And the second thing I'd say is, look at the way the Bible talks about Jesus doing this. Even while it is a revelation of God's character, it's not because he had some supernatural divine strength that he was able to go through this. Jesus did this as a human while also being fully God. And in his humanity, uh, counted others uh, more significant than himself, just as much as his divinity. Which is to say, you can't use that as an excuse to go, God can do that, but he, he's not expecting me to. He, by his spirit, as we pray, uh, and as we think of the example of Jesus, and as we have him in our minds, he enables us to do this more and more. And you won't do it perfectly. I mean, I haven't done it perfectly. In fact, in a few weeks' time, Paul will say himself, I am not already perfect, but I press on. And so don't be discouraged by failure, but pray and keep thinking about Jesus. Jesus, who in his humanity uh, also counted others more significant than himself. Do you have anything to add to that? I don't think, not that's helpful anyway. <laughs> Do you want to share the unhelpful thing? Um, not really. No. <laughs> And um, can I say also, talk to one another about it. Um, when you don't do this, as all of us will fail to do this, uh, speak to God about it, pray, uh, repent, uh, turn back to him. Know that your, your relationship with God is not dependent on you doing this. Jesus saved you. He died for you. He took the punishment for you. Your relationship with him is secured by his performance, not yours. Uh, remember that. That would be a real help. Uh, but keep looking to Jesus. And every time you think this is impossible, think about how much Jesus gave up and press on. Thank you, Tim. A few questions on uh, the humiliation of Jesus, maybe like that, if I can ask both of them. What does the death of Jesus reveal exactly about God? My Muslim friend uh, would say it reveals God as weak. And are humility and humiliation the same? The way the word, the way the world views, sorry, the way the world sees these two things is slightly different, I think. Uh, when seeking to follow Jesus. Uh, you might have to ask the second one again. What does this reveal about God? So many things. The Bible says lots of answers to that question, I think. Not the answer that was suggested in the question. It doesn't reveal that God is weak. I think this shows prof profound strength on the part of the Lord Jesus uh, that he should give up this much. And if you read the gospel accounts of Jesus as he actually went through this, you can see that strength on display. Um, those of us studying Mark are about to go into that whole section. And if you don't see Jesus as the strongest person who has ever lived in that passage, then I just don't understand you. Um, come and talk to me about it. I just think, I've said this lots of times, my favorite passage in the whole Bible is Mark 14. As you see Jesus going through this, it's absolute wonder. There's lots of things that Jesus' death reveals, but here I think what it's revealing is that this pattern of self-giving that Jesus models is at the heart of who God is. So if you want to know what the real God is like, lots of people have their own different gods. Uh, idols have been created over thousands of years. Uh, and they all say something about the, the God they're meant to represent. The real God, uh, the God who made the world, has stepped into his creation and shown us what he's like. And one of the things that he's shown us that he's like is that he's profoundly self-giving, uh, which is a connected idea to the fact that he's gracious and merciful. His rescue of us is by him giving of himself rather than demanding of us. It is a wonderful thing. It is why Christians have been unashamed to say the cross uh, is where you see God, uh, to be unashamed of the cross ever since Jesus died, uh, even though it was at the time a profoundly shameful way to die. Thank you. That second question, I think, really is, are humility and humiliation the same thing? Uh, humility and humiliation are slightly different things. I actually had a conversation with Sarah about this, and she said, don't say humiliation. That would be confusing for everyone. And then I did. Uh, so she was right, and I was wrong, as is too often the case. Uh, humiliation is about... Um, it is normally about someone else doing something to you. Humility is more about how you um, uh, count yourself less than others. Um, humiliation technically, so I was quoting a commentary, in, in its technical sense, it, it can, ha can carry the sense of humility. Um, but what this passage is calling us to is humility. Uh, we're not going around trying to find people who will humiliate us. It's calling us to humility. Verse 3, Have, uh, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Now, that's what I think humility looks like. 
Thank you. On Jesus' exaltation, um, when will every knee bow to him? And in verse 10, when it says knees bowing under the earth, um, what's that about? Uh, So when will it happen? It will happen on a day that, that we don't know exactly when that day will be, a day in the future. It will come at some point any day from now. Um, some of us looked at Mark 13 recently and were reminded that it could happen, I assume that you saw this in Mark 13, uh, that it could happen at any, at any moment. Is that still what you teach in Mark 13? Yeah, great. <laughs> um, it could happen at any moment, which is to say that it may be that tonight or tomorrow every knee will bow. Certainly at some point in the future, every knee will bow. Uh, and I said it earlier, every single knee, that is every single person who's ever lived. I think, I think that might be what's going on uh, with every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Uh, in Jewish thinking, a shale, the place of the dead, was sort of under the earth. And so every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth is every single person, living or dead, will be raised. And the, the teaching through the Bible makes that plain, uh, that all will be raised in the end. Every single one of us, if it doesn't happen for another few hundred years, we will still be there on that day, confessing the Lord Jesus as Lord, uh, either in delight or in defeat, uh, but all of us. Thank you. Um, Was Jesus more glorified after his death than before? And why is this this revealing something about God, not just God the Father vindicating his son? Uh, It certainly is God the Father vindicating his son. Uh, That is what's happening. He's being exalted in a way that says, uh, sort of, this was not a a terrible thing to happen to Lord Jesus. This is not an indication of anything bad on his part. It is a vindication But because Paul uses the word therefore, it seems that it is not just a vindication after this, that, but more than that, a response to what Jesus has done. Now, the first part of that question was, is he more glorious? I just don't think you get that sort of contrast here. I don't think it's saying before he had a little bit of glory and now he's more glorious. Jesus has always, for all eternity, been glorious. But there is something that we now recognize about Jesus and in fact about God that perhaps we didn't see before. All the way through the Bible, you can see that God is glorious, but since Jesus' death, you can see more clearly than ever before something about the God we serve, something about what it means for, Jesus, uh, for, for God to be gracious and merciful, that he is a self-giving God at his very core, if we can speak of him that way. And so I don't, think, I don't think it's saying he's more glorious. I think it's saying we can see something about him and about uh, the Godhead that we couldn't see as clearly before. Thank you. And last question, Um, how does it work that we must have this mind, this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus? Do we have it? Don't we have it? Why does Paul say it like this? And how can we better take on this passage? And what would, what benefit would we see in our church if we did? Oh my goodness, that's about four final questions. (laughs) Have this mind among yourselves. What does that mean? Uh, Do we have it? Don't we have it? I mean, there's a great question just to ask yourself. Do you have it? Don't you have it? There's a sense in which you do, if you're a believer, if there's any encouragement in Christ, those first few verses said. uh, If you have tasted anything of gospel goodness, and if you're a believer, then you have, then embrace the whole thing. Go in wholeheartedly. You know something of this pattern. uh, run, Run with it. But there is also a sense in which he says, have this mind, because you don't. I know I don't. I know in a sense this is a glorious path to walk, but I also know that I I don't pursue it every time I could. And so this is a call to say, have this. It is what you've got in Jesus. It is available to you as a believer because you know the Lord Jesus and you follow him. And if you don't, then there's the call. Uh, Find out about Jesus. Follow him. But if you do, then grasp hold of this pattern. Uh, what could it look like in the church? I mean, you can do that thinking, can't you? Just, just daydream for a little bit about every single person here counting others more significant than themselves and longing for everybody to be saved in that generous, self-giving way that Jesus has set us the pattern for. It'd be brilliant. Wouldn't it be wonderful. Isn't it exciting that we have more weeks in Philippians to help us think about this? But I guess that first step is to consider Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus, and then he shows us the mindset of Jesus. And the reason we're going to finish with a song that talks about the cross 
is because that's where our focus needs to be at the end of tonight. When you recognize, like me, that we're not here yet, Jesus' death is the thing to have front and center, uh, the greatest, uh, the, great, the example of true greatness. That's why we suggested that song. We could have had crown him with many crowns. That was a suggestion that we had. It was a brilliant idea. Uh, when I surveyed the wondrous cross, I thought it would be a great place for us to finish because that's what we, we need to keep doing this week.